The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal Beach, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to uh, contact us, Exxon at Exxon Radio TV on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. To find out about the programming we have available for you 24 7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit www.xzbn.net. And for the programming of the Exxon TV channel and Simul TV, Simultv.com. My guest this hour is longtime MUFON board member Tim Whitmore, and he had been a San Antonio, Texas resident since 1984. Now, originally from Tulsa, Tom graduated with a degree in business administration from Portland State University and had a career in the financial industry since the 1970s. He was most recently employed as a financial analyst with a local firm in San Antonio, where he retired in 2019. He is an accomplished guitarist and has a daughter who is a preschool teacher. Tom was invited to join MUFON board in 1995 and experience the organization's progress through the successive administration of Walt Andrus, uh, all the way through to the present day of Jan Harzan. He serves as treasurer and focuses on long-term and strategic issues for the organization. Now, Tom has been fascinated by military and intelligence agencies' interactions with the UFO public. He has undertaken a research study of the history of the MJ-12 affair and intends to eventually publish his findings. He participates in discussions on the MJ-12 topic by giving presentations to local UFO groups, appearing on internet podcasts and radio shows, and by communicating in social media. Now you can find out everything you'd like to know about Tom on his site. It's www.tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. And joining me now is Tom Whitmore. And Tom, welcome back, or welcome to the x I should say. Hello, Rob, and thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm just delighted to be here. It's a great pleasure having you, sir. And um, wow, you certainly have paid your dues. And, and I kind of envy you because you're retired. And, and here I am, still here, five nights a week, four hours a night. And when I say to my wife, I'm going to retire, she says, <laughs> no. So good for you, pal. Oh, thanks. I know a lot of people don't know what to do with themselves when they retire, but I, I do have a purpose in life here. So I can I certainly see that. I can certainly see that. Uh, how did you get interested in the UFO topic, Tom? Well, I've been interested since I was about 11 years old. Mm -hmm. I was at a friend's house, and I saw a book by Donald Kehoe, uh, Flying oh, yeah. Saucer's Top Secret. And that piqued my interest, and I started reading Donald Kehoe's books. And back then, in the 60s and 70s, UFOs were in the mainstream media quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit more than they have been you know, in the 80s and 90s and so on. So uh, I didn't get active in the field until uh, around 1990. Now, in the 1980s, I happened to turn on the TV and see the UFO cover-up live program. 
And uh, right. then a little bit later, I was walking down the street and I saw a UFO magazine and I bought it and read it. And it had a lot of the current rumors at the time uh, about crash saucers and alien bodies and underground bases and all this. And I, I got really interested in that because I've been reading history, uh, you know, since I was a young person, stacks of history books. And I learned a lot about how uh, governments operate in their own interests. And I started getting interested in espionage and psychological warfare mm -hmm. and combining that with a uh, possible intelligence agency and uh, uh, military involvement in the UFO field. It, it really, it all came together for me. And, ha and how long have you been with, with MUFON and what was your, what was your motivation to join MUFON in the first place? Well, when I started really getting interested in the field and I decided to become active, you know, I really started reading uh, UFO literature. I started keeping up on the field mm -hmm. and I found out about MUFON. Now, I was living in San Antonio and uh, MUFON was being run out of Seguin, Texas by Walt Andrus at that time. And Walt would attend the local meetings in San Antonio. So I started attending the local meetings and uh, I had the privilege of, of getting to know him, and eventually I was able to become the state section director. I had passed the field investigator's exam, and I was doing some field investigations and running the local group. Uh, during that time, uh, Mr. Robert Bigelow began to get involved with the UFO groups, and he started funding uh, certain research projects. And Walt Andrus asked, asked me to administer some of the uh, some of the disbursement of the funds, and then later uh, I was invited onto the board in 1995. So what is it about MUFON that has caused you to be involved with the organization for such a long time? Like, how many years have you been with MUFON? Well, I've been with MUFON mm -hmm. since the early 90s, so, uh, you know, this is... Uh, you go back from 2019 and, and, uh, My goodness. uh, you know, it's, it's going on 30 years. So it has been a long time. And, uh, I feel that, um, the, U the UFO field is a crazy field and being on the MUFON board and being involved with MUFON, uh, we have normal, sober business type problems to address, but also with the craziness in the field, it's easy to just want to walk off and, and quit because so. uh, as, as a volunteer, and I'm a volunteer, and board members are not paid, and I want to make that clear. In fact, I've spent many thousands of dollars of my own money serving on the board over these many years. But uh, as a volunteer, it's very easy to just walk off and quit, and I didn't think that that was right. And once I got on the board, I decided to stick with it. And MUFON has had its ups and downs over the years, as many people no, mm -hmm. but uh, the board has been uh, pretty, pretty stable over the last uh, number of years, and we have really stuck with it. And now, after 50 years, MUFON is still here. How is MUFON, in your opinion, fulfilling its mission? Well, MUFON does uh, basically three things. Uh, we maintain and administer a network of field investigators. We publish a MUFON uh, monthly journal mm -hmm. and website, and we put on an annual symposium. Now, within our field investigation network, and we have a number of state directors, 40, upwards of 40 state directors, and then many other state section directors, uh, but we take in anywhere from 500 to 1,000 case reports every month. And, and then we publish articles and we, we publish um, uh, citing reports mm -hmm. in the monthly journal, uh, and then at our at our annual symposium, we invite you know top level presenters, uh, prominent researchers, and prominent scientists in the UFO field to speak at our annual symposium. And uh, we also publish a booklet of the symposium proceedings every year. And in addition to that, we publish an excellent field investigators manual. And it's kind of ironic because when I hear some of the criticisms of MUFON, I can tell that people don't own a copy of the Field Investigator's Manual. It's extremely detailed, it's very specific, mm -hmm. and it provides excellent training and preparation for UFO field investigators. How many members does MUFON have in the United States? Uh, worldwide. Worldwide, okay. Um, we have 
Well, it varies. It's between three and four thousand. Uh, right now, I believe it's at about thirty-eight hundred uh, total worldwide, uh, and it varies uh, somewhat. Um, I think in the United States we have closer to uh, maybe three thousand, a little over three thousand members. That don't quote me on that. I'm I'm thinking that that's probably the case. In your opinion, are UFO sightings going up or are they kind of stabilizing? Uh, they they vary, and uh, a lady by the name of of um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I haven't seen your moment, but uh, a lady did a study of the of the MUFON data and the uh, National UFO Reporting Center data and found right. that there are more UFO sightings in summer. Now, overall, uh, I believe that UFO sightings are pretty much level, but I will say this: I just on a street level and mm -hmm. talking with social contacts, it seems to me that I'm hearing a, a great increase in numbers of people that are having experiences, uh, experiencers that have either undergone abduction experience, experiences or some kind of contact experience. And I think that, my impression is that is becoming more and more common. All right, Tom, please stand by, sir. You and I have to take our first break. Explanation, my guest is Tom Whitmore, and if you'd like more information about Tom, visit his uh, blog, tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com, and Tom and I will be back on the other side of this break, and we're going to be talking about the infamous MJ-12 papers. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard, and uh, we'll be back right after this very short commercial break. Don't go away. Explanation. My guest this hour is Tom Whitmore. He is with MUFON. And if you'd like more information about uh, Tom, visit his website, tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. And for the information on MUFON, www.mufon.com. Tom, MJ-12. What can you tell us about the MJ-12? Well, you know, like I, like I said, Rob, I've always been interested in history mm -hmm. and getting interested in espionage and intelligence work and even psychological warfare, I found that this was interfacing with the UFO community. And in the 1980s, there developed a pattern of interaction between the Air Force Office of Special Investigations and uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency and certain UFO researchers and groups. And that trend resulted in part in the MJ-12 documents coming into the public domain in the mid-1980s. Now, when I became actively involved in the UFO field around 1990, MJ-12 and Roswell were very prominent in the UFO public at the time. Mm -hmm. And I believe personally that the trend in these questionable documents that have been introduced in the public domain has been occurring at least since the early 80s and continues up to the present time. But isn't there a controversy out there when it comes to the MJ-12 papers? There are people within the UFO community who say they're a fraud, they're a hoax, and then there are those who believe them to be real. How do you justify either side of this story? Well, there, there are a couple of ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. For one thing, uh, there's a possibility that there are certain people that were within the government hierarchy that were not happy with the UFO secrecy, and that they felt that uh, some of this information should be disclosed to the public. Okay. But their their dilemma was, how did they do it without breaking any laws, without uh, uh, disclosing confidential or 
for uh, classified information. And it's possible that the way that they did it was they created these questionable documents. Now, the documents, many of the documents, in fact, probably most of them are not authentic. They're not genuine. But it's possible that they contain important information. For example, I could forge a letter mm -hmm. uh, to be purported by you, but it could contain correct information about you. So that is one possibility. Now, right. there are other explanations, such as uh, the documents may have been uh, issued in the 1980s in order to track Soviet spies, and there's a theory that they're just an out-and-out -out hoax, right. you know, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not claiming that any of the MJ-12 documents are genuine, but I am extremely intrigued uh, with the why. Why did, why did this come about? And why has it basically been going on since the 80s up to the present time? Because in 2017, a document that I call the ultra top secret document uh, came up on the internet and, and it addresses MJ-12 issues. But just because it came up on the internet, how do we know there's any validity behind it? Because, you know, every I, I personally believe, Tom, that the internet is the largest septic tank that mankind has ever created there because in my opinion there's more crap in it than anything else yeah and the internet and social media has oh, completely changed yeah. Yeah. uh the uh the approach that mm -hmm. uh the intelligence agencies can take in terms of disseminating information now in terms of that this particular document the ultra top secret documents what i call it uh it has a section uh, that is the history of MJ-12, and I went straight to that, mm -hmm. and it said that MJ-12 met at Flat Rock, Nevada, at a decommissioned naval air station. Well, I started looking on Nevada map, maps, and I couldn't find Flat Rock, Nevada anywhere. Uh, I've looked at state maps, highway maps, maps of Area 51, mm -hmm. geology maps. There is no Flat Rock, Nevada. And also, I checked into decon into any naval air stations. And there is one naval air station in Nevada, but it's in a completely different area. So those are red flags right there that tell you that there's something wrong with that document. Now, you know, my approach is to study the subject and let the chips fall where they may. I'm not taking the position that the documents are genuine. So you're acting as a real, true investigator. You're getting the facts, and you're letting the facts speak for themselves. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, and that's commendable. I, I, I'm serious. I find that very commendable because I've spoken to so many people over the 30 years doing this show that they go into an investigation with a biased opinion. Now, as a, you know, as a former police investigator myself, that's not how you do an investigation. You do the investigation to the best of the ability, find the facts, investigate every aspect, and like you said, you know, that's how it's done. So what have you found out so far using your investigative prowess to substantiate that there may or may not be a UFO connection with the MJ-12 papers, that they may or may not be part of an intelligence operation in order to track Soviet spies? Yes. Well... There's, there is no smoking gun in mm -hmm. terms of the reality of MJ-12. Right. But there are hints, and uh, there, for example, I have one contact. I won't, I won't name his name of right now. Not. But uh, this person has told me that in his circles, uh, they had heard about MJ-12 for years. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also an interview done by Grant Cameron. Uh, with a person by the name of Eric Walker, mm -hmm. who apparently was involved in this kind of work. And Mr. Walker purportedly told uh, Grant Cameron and, and another researcher that he had known about MJ-12 for, for 40 years. So these are you know little hints and little bits of information that we get that there might be truly something to it. Now, is there, we've is, heard, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask you, if, is there any connection between Grant, Gant, uh, Grant Cameron's book, Red Star Charlie, and MJ-12? I haven't read his book. I've, mm -hmm. I've heard him tell a story about seeing the UFO yeah. and the UFOs up there in Canada. Uh, and I think that that got him interested in the subject to the gotcha. point that he, he decided to dig, 
dig into things as much as he could. And he did uh, do some commendable work in going to uh, all of the presidential uh, libraries, mm-hmm. and which are part of the National Archives, by the way. And he went searching for information. But uh, if MJ-12 does mm-hmm. exist, or if it did exist, it's been very well hidden, and, and we're not going to find anything in in uh, in uh, publicly available documents. Now, in my work, mm-hmm. I'm looking for clues. I don't expect to find a smoking gun. It, it would be it would be fantastic if I did. Right. But I am looking for clues, and I've turned up a couple of interesting things. What has been so far your most significant aha moment? The so-called Eisenhower briefing document, which is a question document, and there there have been many things that have been found wrong with it, Mm -hmm. but it's purportedly uh, a briefing for President-elect Eisenhower before he took office. And the briefing or the briefing document uh, was dated November 18, 1952. I went to the to the Library of Congress, and the Library of Congress has the personal papers of General Nathan F. Twining. And Nathan F. Twining was uh, is uh, an alleged MJ-12 member. I went through his uh, daily logs. Uh, he had a secretary, of course, that wrote down everything, everything he did during the day, who he met with, at what time, yeah. you know, and what what occurred. I went through the entire 1952, I'm sorry, 1952 year, and I'm going through day by day by day, January to July, through September, October. I get to November mm-hmm. 18 the same day that the Eisenhower briefing document is dated. And on that document, it shows that Nathan F. Twining met with, uh, I believe, James Lay concerning President Eisenhower. And that's that was that gave me a jolt. I guess it would. And it doesn't prove anything, but it certainly but it, is an, an but interesting it's, correlation. It, it certainly is. It certainly is. Is there a connection between the MJ-12 papers and what happened in Roswell? Well, if you go by the Eisenhower briefing document, uh, there is. Mm -hmm. And uh, Richard Doty is is another subject, but uh, he he claims to have seen a briefing, been at a briefing in which they uh, had film of the Roswell recovery, of the alleged Roswell recovery, which supposedly actually occurred uh, near Corona, New Mexico, and at a location called Horse Mesa. It was actually two craft that crashed. And the thing is, Rob, if one or more saucers have been recovered with bodies, it's, it's just almost certain that some kind of committee, some kind of secret group would have been formed to study it. And it's a big if. So if, if Roswell is real, then... Yeah it's very likely that MJ-12 or something like it is real. All right, stand by, please. That was my cue that we have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation, Tom Whitmore is our guest. www.tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com And we'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue this very interesting conversation on MJ-12, UFOs, and MUFON. If you'd like to contact uh, anyone at MUFON, if you'd like to report a sighting of something you just can't explain in the skies, whether it's a UFO or UAP, visit www.mufon.com. I'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away.
Pixel Nation, uh, Tom Whitmore is our special guest. Uh, Tom is one of the directors at MUFON. Uh, his website is tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. And for all the information on MUFON, or if you'd like to report uh, something in the sky that you believe is either a UFO or UAP, visit www.mufon.com. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about... Uh, Richard Do uh, Doty, former AF OSI special agent, doesn't he have kind of a bad reputation? Well, he did have a bad reputation in the 90s, and uh, it partly arose out of uh, a difficult situation that, that I think he was involved in with a person by the name of Paul Benowitz, uh, and word got out uh, about what was going on there. And also, Richard Doty was associated with William Moore, uh, a top UFO researcher at the time. And William Moore, uh, in 1989 at the MUFON Symposium in mm -hmm. Las Vegas, gave a sort of a confession uh, presentation in which he admitted uh, to trying to burrow his way into the military intelligence complex to learn as much as he could about UFOs. And in doing so, uh, in a kind of relationship, he acted as a as an informant uh, to AFOSI and, and possibly other groups. So uh, Richard to Doty uh, was a contact of his, and actually Richard Doty uh, recruited Bill Moore. And because of that association, uh, I think there there was a lot of um, there was a lot of ill feeling about that. Now, I'd also like to say that I'm not here to advocate for Richard Doty, but but to be fair, yeah. I think there was a lack of information about what really occurred at that time. And I think there were some misunderstandings about Doty's role. Doty was a special agent for the AFOSI, and he was under orders. He was doing what he was told to do. Let's talk about uh, the uh, To the Stars Academy. What do you think about the current community, uh, uh, the UFO community, and the association with TTSA? Well, you know, I think we all in the UFO community were really excited when uh, TTSA came out. And there's this very intriguing uh, relationship that Tom, Tom DeLong claims to have had uh, with at least one uh, top uh, general in, in the DOD mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, apparently uh, feeding him information and giving him a green light to go public with this. I do think, though, unfortunately, that the way that... Uh, to the Stars Academy has rolled out some of this information that it's caused a lot of confusion. And I think because of that, uh, you know, there, there's some ill feeling in the UFO community, even there, though I think there are a lot of people in the UFO community that view TTSA positively and still have a, a lot of hope that they're going to be uh, coming out with, with uh, important information in the future. You know, uh, I, I have a a bit of a problem understanding or, or actually putting any credibility into the disclosure uh, issue because here we are in a world that is that is run by computers basically and you have organizations like um, WikiLeaks who have brought forth documents on you know uh, presidential candidates and you have other hackers who've broken in and stolen government information and yet if anybody wanted to cause a major coup within the American government all they would have to do is hack a computer get the information that was proof positive that UFOs are real they are from another planet that there has been government interaction with them and that, you know, they are here, and we've known about it for years, and yet nobody's come out with that information. Well, and, yeah, and, you know, WikiLeaks has released a lot of information, mm -hmm. and some other hackers have done some interesting things. But I think we have to remember, too, Rob, that there's a lot of information in the government that has not been hacked and that has not come out. I agree. Um, and we have to, but we have to, realize, too, that if the UFO information exists, it's either very hard to get to, mm -hmm. or it's very well hidden, 
or possibly doesn't exist at all. Oh. But going back, going back to Richard Doty for mm -hmm. a second, Richard Doty has said that after, and he said this in, in interviews, that after uh, the, UF, the Air Force got out of the UFO business in 1969, after the Condon report, that the Air Force went shopping around for another agency to take up the UFO problem. And the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency did and that the Defense Intelligence Agency became the clearinghouse for UFO information. So it's possible that the, whatever mm -hmm. information is kept is somehow within the confines of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And Doty even said that uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency even had a group that investigated abductions. But to investigate something and to come to a conclusion based on that investigation are two different things. Yeah. You know, you invest, But we don't you, know what information they have. <laughs> That's... And we don't even know if those investigations really happened. Yes, that's right. You know, we uh, don't have confirmation. Exactly. Exactly. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the Tic Tac video and the gun camera, uh, footage that kind of launched TTSA thanks to the uh, reporters at the um, what newspaper in New York was it? The New York, New York Times. Times. Yeah. There's a lot of controversy about this now when you've got other one of the questions that I had was why the Navy? Why not the Air Force? How come no other branch of the military has reported these? Only the Navy. How come None of the satellite defense systems picked up these, these uh, Tic Tacs. There's so many questions that have yet to be answered. And yet so many people are taking the legitimacy of the of this sighting. I'm not saying that the, the sighting didn't happen. I'm just trying to f justify how people jump to the conclusion that they have to be UFOs from another planet instead of just experimental aircraft that have been under development for several years, especially when we know for a fact that, the, that there has been experimental aircraft uh, tested in that very area where this Tic Tac sighting was made. So how do, how, do we ju how do we justify the jump from experimental, terrestrial, to something that is from outer space? Yeah. It's possible that they are experimental or advanced aircraft mm -hmm. that we don't know about. Right. But the problem with that, as I see it, is that the performance of these aircraft is so way beyond anything that our conventional technology is capable of that it tends to make me think that it may not just be uh, advanced technology on our part. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to remember, too, that the pilots themselves saw these objects performing the maneuvers that they did okay. that were way, way beyond anything that we know about at this time, at least publicly. But is it, and uh, I, I think that their testimony, I, I think it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to discount their, their testimony. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to discount their, their testimony by any stretch of the imagination. What I am trying to say is that they themselves and no one has been able to prove that they are not experimental aircraft, that we have not superseded what the public knows about the defense industry and what the defense industry has been capable to do without public knowledge up to this point. You know, I can, we can point to the Aurora, we can point to the Pegasus launches, and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm yeah. saying that how can we make the positive assumption and TTSA is doing a great job of this by pointing the public with the media attention that they've gotten to this being proof of extraterrestrial existence. Yeah, well, I, I agree with yeah. you. We should be careful in uh, evaluating this. But another problem that we have is we actually have a very limited amount of information about it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we, we have these little video clips that they mm -hmm. show, you know, of the object on the gun camera film, but there's much more uh, video. There's much more footage of, of the behavior of these craft. Uh, but all we have are these little snippets and we have the testimony of the pilots. You know, and, and uh, we're dealing with limited information. In the broadcast industry, 
you take a lot of footage and what you do is you use the most tantalizing, the most sensationalistic footage to make your point. So you don't see the sure. before and you don't see the after and it's usually the footage before and after that really tells the story, not just what the editor wants you to see. Uh, you were also mentioning about the uh, the American government dropping their UFO investigations. I mean, this, the Air Force. Up here in Canada, the Canadian government has dropped it totally and put it in the lap of Chris Rutowski at the University of Manitoba. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hey, listen, we... Yeah. yeah, so when we come back, uh, let's talk a little bit more and... Uh, Thank you so much for coming on. This has been a great hour. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Tom Whitmore, www.tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. And Tom and I will be back as we wrap up this hour here in the Exo from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal Beach, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget www.xzbn.net for the Exo Broadcast Network and for all the programming available to you on the Exo TV channel www.simultv.com where you can watch Simul TV now on Roku. So, Nation, my guest this hour is Tom Whitmore, www.tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. First of all, Tom, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And as I told you during the commercial break, I have thoroughly enjoyed our, our discussion. And uh, anytime you want to come back, the door is always open. And thank you, Rob. It's been a delight to be on your show tonight. Thank you, sir. Um, just before we went to the commercial break, I was mentioning that you were talking about how the United States Air Force kind of dropped the uh, the investigation of UFOs. And up here in Canada, the Canadian government dropped it and they put it in the lap of Chris Rutowski at the University of Manitoba. What does this tell you, as, as an investigator, the attitude that both governments are taking? Well, the Air Force had paid its dues mm -hmm. from the 1940s through the 1950s and the 1960s. And they had to deal with the very thorny public relations issues involved with the UFO uh, problem, and all kinds of things were going on. You know, you had the uh, you had the contactees like George Adamski yes. and George Van Tassel and, and that those types, and and then you had uh, the legitimate UFO sightings that were were really of high strangeness, and then you had all the noise, you know, the people seeing Venus and all that. This, the Air Force had to deal with all that, and they were sick and tired of it because they were really in the business of defending this country. That's right, yeah. So they, they were looking for ways to get out of it, and they did. They did get out of it. Now, I think that we have to remember, and I, I'm quoting Richard Doty again, but according to him, the AFOSI investigates any UFO incidents that affect uh, Air Force uh, bases, Air Force bases, Air Force property, airplanes or Air Force personnel. Now, the dichotomy that I see, the, the disconnect, is that that almost certainly is true and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And yet, if Air Force pilots and other pilots report a UFO, it actually goes against their career and they regret ever reporting it and it could actually ground them and end up uh, having a desk job instead of flying. So, I, I see a real disconnect there. And I think since the Air Force has gotten out of uh, the UFO business publicly, mm -hmm. that they have made every effort to not get involved publicly in the UFO field at all. Now, they were forced to get back into it in the 1990s after the Roswell uh, controversy came up. And Representative Stephen Schiff in New Mexico had been getting these complaints and these complaints uh, uh, claims by uh, people that were involved 
in the Roswell affair, and he was able to uh, induce a GAO investigation. And then I think the Air Force had to cover their tracks, and they came out with this phone book size report uh, claiming that the Roswell incident was probably caused by a mogul balloon. And uh, the UFO community and the public came back and said, what about the bodies? Yeah. And they came out with a second report called Case Closed, in which they claimed that so-called crash dummies were, uh, were responsible for these bodies reports. So in, in those efforts, the Air Force had, I think, from a UFO uh, participant perspective, the, UF, the Air Force had discredited itself. And some of the inside track on this is that if you ask the people that were involved in creating these reports, they admit they were doing what they were told. Why don't, why is it then, if all the evidence is there and so many UFO investigators believe it is that we have been visited, 1947 was the the focal point at that time. Roswell, New Mexico is the mecca of ufology. Uh, Betty and Barney Hill are legitimate. Uh, Travis Walton is legitimate. And the list goes on and on and on. That the government does have files. There are hidden craft and extraterrestrials at Area 51. If all this is legitimate, why is it then the government, and I'm going to put MJ-12 in there as well, why doesn't the government just come up and say, you know what, guys? They're here. Uh -huh. Well, there, there are a couple possibilities there. One is the information doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's, there's nothing that the government has to disclose. I think that's unlikely. Okay. Secondly, uh, if uh, a craft was recovered and bodies and possibly more than one, mm -hmm. uh, possibly several, uh, they have basically been lying to the American public since the 1940s and saying that there's nothing to it. So they're in a really difficult position if they come out now and say, well, <laughs> uh, we want to tell you that there is really something to this and we do have proof. Well, that, that's going to create a very awkward situation, to say the least. A third possibility is that there's bad news in this. I see. That there are things that people are not going to want to hear and you get into the business of being careful what you ask for because you may not like the answers that you get. And that could possibly be a reason why there has not been more disclosure. Is it possible that even if the president of the United States came out and said, listen, they're here, that people wouldn't believe them? Or that other, other, other leaders of other countries would come out and say they're here, that nobody would actually believe them? Yeah, things have gotten so confused yeah. now with with the internet and this 24-hour news cycle mm. and partisan type news reporting and fake news it's it's almost getting to the point to where people don't don't know what to believe and i'll tell you personally when i see a news report i often just take it with a grain of salt because i don't have the time and the energy to investigate all That's of right. that and and find out what the facts really are it wouldn't surprise me in the least if even if uh, a certain amount of disclosure or confirmation occurred, that a lot of people wouldn't even accept it, wouldn't believe it. Do you think disclosure will eventually happen? I don't know. Uh, some people think that, that it is going to happen eventually. Mm -hmm. I personally have the theory that this information has been introduced in the public into the public through a backdoor process, through these uh, questionable documents. Right. And what, what, what's happened, and, and Grant Cameron uh, says this all the time, and I agree with him, that these documents are created in such a way that they always provide plausible deniability. There's, there's always something wrong with them. But at the same time, there, there is certain information in these documents yeah. that is seeping into the public domain, into the public consciousness, and if you consider what people uh, think is possible today compared with, say, 50 years ago, it's completely different. You and know, the public is, I believe, much more acclimated to the idea that we've been visited by uh, non-terrestrial over, over my years doing this show, I've, you know, I've interviewed many authors. 
And they will. T- they have told me point blank, if they want to get a point across, they will do it in a fictional book rather than in a, in a um, biography because people are more tended and more open to the possibility when reading a fictional book. So you add a little bit of truth, you add a little bit of fiction, and you add a little, you know, and this is, what you, I guess, basically what you're saying about the MJ-12 papers. Yeah, and also yeah. people in military and intelligence that have uh, a lot of classified background and mm-hmm. classified experience in classified programs, uh, a lot of times they end up writing novels because they can't get the information cleared by the censors That's right. and DOD. You know, in uh, in a nonfiction format, so they end up writing it in a fictional format, and that's how it gets into the public domain. My final question, and we're running out of time very fast. I've got about a minute and a half here. Um, what do you see for the UFO field going into the year twenty twenty? Well, you know, and I just think the UFO field has always been dirt difficult. Uh, uh, groups don't cooperate. Mm-hmm. People don't cooperate. Some people do. But it would be fantastic if we could somehow all get together and pool our information. Isn't it, yeah. And, and I think that the social media certainly provides a possibility for people to cooperate more. Unfortunately, a lot of people are misusing social media, and it's creating division, and, it, and, it, and it's creating, creating discord. I think we just have to keep at it and do the best that we can with the resources we have and, and keep working at it and be patient. Tom, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank you for the investigations that you're doing and the professionalism that, that you bring to the table. It is sincerely appreciated. Please keep up the big work, uh, the, uh, the great work that you're doing. And um, let our listeners know once again how they can find out more about you and the work that you're doing. Yes, you can uh, read my blog at tomwhitmoreblog.wordpress.com. And uh, you can uh, uh, message me there. I'm also on Facebook, Tom Whitmore. You can friend me, and we can uh, communicate by Facebook Messenger. And, Rob, I want to thank you again for having me on your show. It's been really great. I've really enjoyed it. It's been my great pleasure. I look forward to the next time you visit us, Tom. Please don't be a stranger. Okay, thank you. Merry Christmas, Tom. Merry Christmas to you. Exonation. Nation, Tom Whitmore. Once again, Tom Whitmore blog.wordpress.com and don't forget MUFON M-U-F-O-N dot com I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Ham- uh, I used my gosh after 30 years saying Hamilton every night let me try that one again huh. from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal Beach Ontario Canada right on the shores of Lake Erie uh, the Exxon will continue on the other side of this break and just before i go don't forget if you'd like to get your top box of simul tv's great packages all you need to do is go to their website at www.simultv.com i'm rob mcconnell this is the exxon don't go away